In today's lecture, we're going to be covering Mesopotamia and Persia. We'll begin by looking at the location, which is the Fertile Crescent. Off to the left, you can see the Mediterranean Sea, and the Fertile Crescent arches up through Israel, Lebanon, Syria, and Turkey before descending down into Iraq and the Persian Gulf. Of particular interest for us is right here toward the center of the screen between the Euphrates and Tigris rivers we have Mesopotamia. This is an area that's going to be named by the Greeks centuries later, and Mesopotamia translates to the land between two rivers. As with last chapter, we're covering the Stone Age, but here this is the very end of the Stone Age and the beginning or transition into the Bronze Age. Around 8000 to 2000 BC, we start to see the Ice Age ending and the world becomes a much more habitable place. Humans become more agrarian. They start to farm. We see the domestication of animals. The shelters that they're building, much more permanent than anything we saw in Chapter 1. And life expectancy is still pretty low, under 40 years old. Humans also begin to live in communities or small cities. We have some really great inventions during this time. The wheel, the plow, cuneiform writing, beer, the development of schools, libraries, and written laws. These all take place before 2000 BC. Unfortunately, it's still not, wonderful, not a wonderful area to live or to be alive during this time. We have a tremendous amount of political instability, not unlike today, and there's constant warfare from outside sources. We'll begin taking a look at the Sumerian culture, but they're quickly taken over by the Akkadians, who are then taken over by the Babylonians, and then we have the Assyrians, and so on. So with the Sumerian culture, we'll first take a look at the city of Jericho. Now, if you read through chapter one, you'll notice that Jericho was actually in that chapter, but I didn't cover it. Because of the location of Jericho, it just fits much better into chapter two. But it's among the earliest cities that we have, covering six to 10 acres in size, with a population of between two and 3,000 inhabitants. And for this time, this is a huge city. The building materials used is mud brick, and of course this building, like any other buildings made during this, chap during this uh, semester, are going to be made using the shell system, which means one basic building material provides the core structure for the building, the framework, as well as the outer covering. The fortification walls they were 20 feet high and 5 feet thick. Again, this is a very warlike time, so those were definitely needed. There was a tower, 28 feet high and 33 feet in diameter, that had an internal staircase, which is a huge architectural achievement. The city dates from 8000 to 7000 BC, definitely in the Neolithic time period, but for as much of the city as we've uncovered and still have today, and when you figure that's 10,000 years old, that's a pretty remarkable site. There was even a water tower that was built for irrigating crops. Another city that we have is Ein Gazal. Now, I don't have any pictures of the city to show you, but what's really incredible are the artifacts that are found there. The city dates from 7,000 to 6,000 BC roughly 30 acres in size, so five times as big as Jericho. It was populated for 2,000 years. And the figure at the right, those are one of 36 figures unearthed from this city. Now the book will tell you 30, but there were six more unearthed recently. And it's a complete advancement from prehistoric sculpture, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. These figures are modeled rather than carved, and we kind of have to go back and look at how sculpture is created. During the prehistoric times, and even through contemporary times, one of the ways to create sculpture is by the subtractive method. You take an object, whether it's stone or ivory or marble, 
and you cut and chip and gouge away until the desired result is achieved. But here we're dealing with the additive process of sculpture. We're not only dealing with it here with modeling, but we'll also deal with it later with casting. And here we're adding material until the desired form is achieved. Uh, the basic framework for these sculptures were reeds and twine, and then wet plaster was applied to the outside. Shells were used for eyes, and the pupils were created from spots of bitumen. The figures also had wigs and clothing, and they were ritually buried, so perhaps they mirrored the people who had passed away. The largest of these figures was approximately three feet high. And again, the difference between Paleolithic and Neolithic sculpture deals with how they were created. Throughout the Paleolithic era, we're looking at objects that were carved using the subtractive process rather than built up as we see with the image at the right. And as we continue on through our study of sculpture, even with the next chapter with the Egyptian civilization, you're looking at even larger sculptures, larger than life size. The work of Ace is pretty cool because here we have our very first narrative in art history. It's about 36 inches high and it's made from alabaster, found near the city of Uruk. And what this does is it tells a story. You can see the different bands of scenes taking place, and those are called registers. The lowest one shows the natural world and mostly water and plants. The next one up we have alternating rams and ewes, which are male and female sheep, and they're right in this area here. The next register are men that are carrying baskets of Earth's bountiful harvest. And finally, the top register, that is going to be where we have the goddess Inanna, the goddess of love and war as she accepts an offering from the priest king. So the vase depicts kind of a religious festival in her honor. And again, we're looking at a narrative being constructed, a story, rather than just paintings that are on cave walls that are representations of animals, but we don't see a coherent story here. One of the earliest architectural features we see in the Middle East are ziggurats, and they are extremely cool. Uh, they're basically a platform, and at the very top of the platform, we're going to have a temple. And why do we do this? Um, there's a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, it would protect the temple from any flooding that happens in this area but also it elevates the temple closer to heaven. And so there may be a little bit more of a linking between heaven and earth by using one of these. And these were massive structures that were built near the center of the city. So again, when we see something like that, we can say that because this is a religious structure, that religion played a very important part in this civilization. This is the best preserved ziggurat, which is at the city of Ur. And the base is a solid mass of mud brick standing about 50 feet high. We have three ramps of stairs meeting at a central gateway, each having a hundred steps. And then there is another ramp that leads up to the actual temple. It was said that the Tower of Babel was also a ziggurat that stood 270 feet high in the city of Babylon. But this got too close to heaven and angered God. So God was angry because it was built more for the glorification of man than for the glory of God. And so God comes down and confuses our languages and scatters people throughout the earth. The White Temple at Uruk 
was the largest and earliest of the ziggurats. This would have been whitewashed, which was why we called it the White Temple. And it would have just been an incredible sight with the desert sun uh, reflecting off of its surface. We're going to take a look at some of these Voda figures, which you would have found in the temples, for instance, on top of the ziggurat. Uh, they're made from limestone. Their faces, body, hair, and clothing, very simple geometric shapes. And even their bodies um, tend to be very cylindrical. The eyes of the figures are enhanced, and Sumerians believe that eyes were the windows to the soul. The largest uh, figure is Abu, which is the god of vegetation. And the smaller figures, they depict individuals or mortals, and they're placed in the shrine or temple facing the more elaborate image of the god. And they're used as stand-ins or proxy, uh, basically representing the person who commissioned the, chap the, uh, the statue. Um, some of these have been found with the owner's names inscribed on them, or the specific prayer that they're giving on behalf of the owner. Um, if you were busy, you would commission an artist to create one of these statues and place them in the temple or shrine so that it takes your place for praying uh, because we're busy, we have work to do, and these pray for us. Another really cool work is the bull-headed harp, or lyre. And this was found in a royal tomb at Ur. And it basically looked like a box had collapsed um, on the floor. Um, it was just disassembled. The bull's head is made from gold and semi-precious stones. And when we look at the front panel off screen to the right there, we can kind of see this story being told and it's kind of creepy. We have the animals uh, acting as humans and it's definitely creepy. Uh, working from the bottom up, the, the bottom register you have the scorpion man holding something in his hands with a gazelle behind him holding two cups. Scorpion men are associated with the land of the demons. In the next register up, we have uh, a number of animal musicians, a donkey assisted by a bear playing a harp lyre uh, that looks like the work that we're looking at. In the next register up from there, we have a lion and a hyena, again, imitating human posture, bringing food and drink to a feast. The hyena having a knife on his belt, and he appears to be a butcher, and you can see like just these segments of animals uh, as if he's bringing meat to the table. And then up top in the northernmost register, we have a bearded man in the center, his arms around two human-headed bulls. And this is a very common feature found in Near Eastern art. This could be the deceased of whose tomb the liar was in. And there's a lot of theories about the top and bottom registers uh, being stories from the Epic of Gilgamesh although that story or book wasn't written for another 700 years after the lyre was completed. Uh, real quickly, we'll take a look at cylinder seals, and then um, we'll have to switch to part two of the presentation. Um, cylinder seals are about an inch and a half in height and about another half an inch in diameter, usually made from marble or some other type of stone and the artist carves a narrative into the surface and you kind of roll it out over a damp clay surface and the seal would then leave its impression and of course the clay would dry and you could not open the document or the container lid um, without breaking the seal and so it's kind of similar to maybe a coat of arms that we would see during the middle ages or even a brand that we put on cattle today